Wonderful to see everybody. Um, I've got some new technology that I'm trying to, to work out. Um, you know, we've been recording this quarter, but we've been dependent upon the microphone in the camera. And that's kind of a long reach. So we got this microphone, but understand that there's no speakers down here. So the microphone is not for you. It's for whoever's watching later to get better audio quality on the video. So um, you, if you're thinking like, wow, I'm not hearing any, you know, well, you're not supposed to. So we are going to start in Jeremiah 9, uh, but we're going to eventually get to chapters 18 and 19 for our, our focus today. We're talking this morning about God's judgment upon Judah. And in this lesson, we're talking about his judgment upon the nation in kind of more of a generic and conceptual way. We're going to have a lesson later on, uh, I forget the lesson number. In your, ta your table of contents, you can see the lesson number. The lesson that's going to be titled, um, The Fall of Jerusalem, I think is, okay, number 10. When we get to lesson 10, we're going to talk specifically about the things that happened when Jerusalem fell. And we're going to get into um, some pretty depressing and, and um, nasty details about what happened when the city fell. So today's is really more of a conceptual kind of a discussion where Jeremiah is saying, this is what's coming. And he uses various symbols uh, and actions to, to display that. But before we get to the conceptual part and to those symbols, we need to talk about why God's judgment came. And we've really had a lot to say about that so far this quarter. If you could just boil it down to a, a few words, why is this judgment going to come upon the nation of Judah? They didn't to God. All right, they didn't listen to God. Somebody said they turned their backs on God. Rebellion. I'm sorry? Rebellion. Rebellion, sin, wickedness, evil, right? Yeah, we, we've seen that a, a number of times. I asked you to look at this passage in Jeremiah 9 because this passage succinctly states uh, what we have been talking about from numerous passages and kind of skipping around all quarter. Chapter 9 and verse 12 beginning, Who is the wise man that may understand this? And who is he to whom the mouth of the Lord has spoken that he may declare it? Why is the land ruined, laid waste like a desert? so that no one passes through. You, you see, that's kind of a forward-looking question. Why is the land like this? Well, it isn't yet, right? It, it's future. It, it's looking down the road. Somebody might say, why is the land laid waste like this and no one is passing through? No one lives here. The Lord said, verse 13, because they have forsaken my law, which I set before them, they have not obeyed my voice, nor walked according to it, but have walked after the stubbornness of their heart and after the bales as their fathers taught them. So verses 13 and 14 just succinctly summarizes, this is why the nation is falling. This is why the land is going to be desolated and laid waste like a desert. So even with this judgment that Jeremiah has been saying is going to come, and here are the reasons why it's going to come. Even with that, all along, God through Jeremiah gives these little, little opportunities to repent. This is what I'm going to do. Judgment, bad, destruction, devastation. It's going to be terrible. But if you will turn, right, you, you see that kind, of, uh, that kind of language scattered throughout Jeremiah. And you see some examples of this in chapter 26 which I don't want to really go into great detail on 26 because we're going to do that Wednesday night, Lord willing. Uh, but in chapter 26 and in verse 3, the Lord says, Perhaps they will listen and everyone will turn from his evil way that I may repent of the calamity which I am planning to do to them because of their evil deeds. God says, if they will turn and listen and start obeying me, then I will repent. Is it kind of unusual to think about God repenting? But what does repentance mean? Turning, changing your mind, right? 
And so God says, I will repent of this destruction that I'm planning to bring upon them. And then I want you to look at this passage in Lamentations 3 uh, before we get into chapters 18 and 19 of Jeremiah. Look at Lamentations chapter 3. Because here, Lamentations, we're, we're, we're going to have more, much more to say about this in lesson number 10. We're going to be almost exclusively in the book of Lamentations. But Lamentations is a, obviously, a lament that Jeremiah uh, writes after Jerusalem has fallen. And so the devastation that Jeremiah prophesied for decades has come about. It's happened. And he's looking over the city that's been destroyed and the people massacred and the, the, the city of Jerusalem has just been burned to the ground. If you look at Lamentations chapter 3 and verse 31, the Lord will not reject forever, for if he causes grief, then he will have compassion according to his abundant loving kindness, for he does not afflict willingly or grieve the sons of men. He does not afflict willingly. Literally, it means he doesn't afflict people from his heart. And I love that idea. The concept is God is not watching his people be slaughtered and his city of Jerusalem be destroyed. He's not sitting there watching it thinking, oh man, this is great. Boy, this makes me feel so good. I'm so happy that this is what's going on in Jerusalem. That's not the heart of God uh, that this comes from. He, he watches this massacre and he watches the city be destroyed and it breaks his heart. It's not what he wanted. He's not afflicting willingly or, or from his heart. Kyle? Even like, sit back and watch it and say, I'm so glad they're getting what they deserve. Like it's, it's not just that he's not enjoying it. Well, think about how, th think about our parents who said this to us, right? When we got a spanking, what did they say to us? This hurts me more than it hurts you, right? What is that? that that's what this verse is saying. You know, God is saying, look, I, I had to do this. I didn't want to, though. I, I don't enjoy this. And when we spank our children, we don't enjoy spanking our children. I mean, that's, that's evil and that's abusive. Um, but as we are disciplining our children, we understand we have to do this. We're not going to change their heart or change their behavior if we don't do this. And God is speaking to us in the same kind of a way uh, in this passage. All right. Anything else about those uh, first few questions on, on your material before we get to the meat of our study today? Okay. Jeremiah 18. Let's go there. Jeremiah 18, all right, Jeremiah 18 and verse 1, the word which came to Jeremiah from the Lord saying, arise and go down to the potter's house and there I will announce my words to you. Then I went down to the potter's house, and there he was, making something on the wheel. But the vessel that he was making of clay was spoiled in his hand. So he remade it into another vessel, as it pleased the potter to make. All right. Have any of you ever tried your hands at pottery? How did it go? Christine, how did it go when you were trying to make a pot? Okay, but how did you do with it? How, what? how did you do with it? Like, did you make something, like, was it easy? What, did you make something that was really beautiful? Or was it like, okay, this was neat, um, but I was terrible at it, right? I was in high school. You were in high school. Okay, <laughs> all right. All right. Anybody else thrown a pot before? It was like a Ray Dunn mug. It looked like a Ray Dunn mug? Yeah. <laughs> okay, yeah, yeah. Uh, it's shameful that I know what those are. Um, we, we have three or four of them that have been gifted to us, but you know, those mugs there, they are intentionally made to have like awkward shapes in them and things. And 
kind of a pain to drink coffee out of, I think, because you kind of <laughs> you try to figure out how to make your mouth fit to it, and it's, it's really awkward. If you've ever tried throwing a pot, though, it's easy to mess up. You know, you get the wheel spinning too fast, or if the clay is too wet, uh, it, it becomes too thin, and you stretch it out too much, and, and, and as you're molding this clay, it's really hard to make something that's symmetrical. Brian used that term earlier. Uh, if you're trying to make a vase or something like that, uh, it, you don't want it to be all, as we say in the South, cattywampus. Uh, you want it to be symmetrical. You want it like, <laughs> the Markhams are like, what did he say? <laughs> cattywampus? What does that mean? Um, it's hard to make a beautiful pot that is shaped correctly, proportionally, symmetrical, and all that. Uh, one of my mom's brothers, as uh, many of you know, uh, is a potter in Gatlinburg. And so uh, I've thrown a few pots in my life. They've all been terrible. Uh, I have a bowl in my office that, um, you know, if you squint and kind of turn your head just the right way, you, you can figure out that it's a bowl. Um, but it's, it's really difficult to, to make something on a potter's wheel. So when Jeremiah goes to the potter's house and he sees this potter sculpting on the wheel, what happens to the piece that he's molding? It's marred. It's spoiled in his hand. Okay, so he, you know, we don't know exactly what happened, but we can surmise that he, the shape got messed up or it, it got off kilter somehow. I don't know what it was exactly. But what is the potter at that stage in the game capable of doing? Start over. You start over. Yeah, when that pot... Uh, well, it's not a pot yet. When that clay is soft and uh, you, you're applying the moisture to it and you can shape it and mold it, you just take your hands on it. I've watched my uncle do this a million times. You take your hands on it, you compress it down, and you start over with a new chunk of clay, and then you start to shape it again. And I'm sure there are some limits on how many times you can do that. Like, I guess at some point the clay ceases to be workable. But you can do that a few times. And uh, that's what Jeremiah sees this this potter do. He spoils the, the, the vessel, but he starts over again. And God wants Jeremiah to see this because God wants to make a point from this. So look at verse 5. The word of the Lord came to me saying, Can I not, O house of Israel, deal with you as this potter does? Behold, like the clay in the potter's hand, so are you in my hand, O house of Israel. All right, you, you seeing the point that God is making with this? God is trying to shape this nation to mold them into what He wants them to be. Well, the pot has been spoiled. Now, of course, that wasn't God's fault. It wasn't the potter who made the mistake there. But God is using this illustration to say, we can start this thing over again. I can still mold you and shape you into what I want you to be. And so God is going to give some examples uh, about what he might do. Look at verse 7. At one moment I might speak concerning a nation or concerning a kingdom to uproot, pull down, or destroy it. If that nation against which I have spoken turns from its evil, I will relent concerning the calamity I planned to bring on it. So if there is a nation that is doing evil, and I have determined that it needs to be judged. But if that nation changes its ways, I will reshape the pot. I will form it again, and I will relent about this disaster. I'll change my mind, okay? Then in the next two verses, he's going to say the same thing, just in opposite terms. In verse 9, or at another moment, I might speak concerning a nation or a kingdom to build up or to plant it. If it does evil in my sight by not obeying my voice, then I will think better of the good with which I had promised to bless it. So a nation that he's going to enable to arise and grow strong and a, and a new empire, a new kingdom is going to come along. But if they're evil people, he says, I can easily change my mind and I can take that clay and shape it again however I see fit. I want you to notice, though, that at this point, the clay is soft, it's 
fluid, malleable, thank you, yes, that's the better term. Fluid's not exactly what I was wanting. Um, it's, it's capable of being shaped at this point. In chapter 19, we're going to see a situation where that's not the case. All right. So God gives this interpretation of the symbol. But notice, who has he been speaking to in verse 6? The house of Israel. Well, now, wait a minute. Israel's, Israel's not even here anymore. Wait a minute. What, what's going on? Well, in verse 11, he brings it down to the people of Judah. Speak to the men of Judah and against the inhabitants of Jerusalem, saying, Thus says the Lord, Behold, I am fashioning calamity against you and devising a plan against you. O oh, turn back, each of you, from his evil way and reform your ways and your deeds. Remember what he's just said in verses 7 and 8. If there's a kingdom that I'm going to uproot and tear it down, if they will repent, I'll change my mind, right? I'll shape the clay into something else. He's just said in 7 and 8, this is what I'm willing to do. So in 11, he says, Judah, this is what's coming to you. Judgment, calamity, please repent. I don't want to do this. I will change if you will change. But what was the response of the people in verse 12? Nah, we're not going to do it. They will say, it's hopeless. For we are going to follow our own plans and each of us will act according to the stubbornness of his evil heart. It's hopeless. We can't change. We don't want to change. We're just going to do what we want to do. They are determined to follow in their evil ways. So, what choice does God have? This calamity that he's been planning is going to come. And that's what he talks about in verses 13 through 17. Just kind of in a prophetic, poetic kind of a way, describes what this judgment is going to, to look like. Uh, verse 15, my people have forgotten me. They burn incense to worthless gods, and they have stumbled from their ways from the ancient paths. Uh, their, their land, verse 16, will be made a desolation. Everyone who passes by will be astonished and shake his head. Wow, this once amazing city, the city where God, what, this once great nation, look at what it's been reduced to. Everybody's just going to shake their head in disbelief. So now in verse 18 the people turn against Jeremiah. They don't like what he's been saying. And we're going to have some more to talk about this beginning on Wednesday night. We're going to start looking at several examples in Jeremiah where his life is threatened, where he's been mistreated. We're going to talk about his preaching and the reactions to his preaching beginning on Wednesday. But here's a, uh, an example of this. Verse 18, they said, come and let us devise plans against Jeremiah. Surely the law is not going to be lost to the priest, nor counsel to the sage, nor divine word to the prophet. Come on and let us strike at him with our tongue and let us give no heed to any of his words. That business about the law will not leave the priest and the word of God, will, or word from God will not leave the prophet. I understand that too. The, the people are kind of saying it this way. We have prophets. And we have another lesson on the false prophets that, uh, that are in the book of Jeremiah. There are false prophets in the land who are saying, stop listening to Jeremiah. Everything's fine. He's talking about judgment and gloom and doom. Don't listen to him. Okay? So the people here are saying, we have our prophets. God is speaking through them. Why should we listen to Jeremiah and all the bad things that he's saying? And obviously their prophets, God was not speaking through them. The, the true prophet was Jeremiah. And these others were false prophets. But the people said, oh, God is with us. Look at what these other prophets are saying. God's not going to stop speaking to them. The word will not fail from the prophet. So let's get rid of this one prophet that nobody likes. Let's speak evil of him. Let's um, attack him with the tongue it is literally the, the expression. Let's drum up some charges against him. Let's make some false accusations about him. And let's slander him and hopefully... You know, they, they want this to result in his death.
So Jeremiah responds in verse 19. Do give heed to me, O Lord, and listen to what my opponents are saying. Should good be repaid with evil? For they have dug a pit for me. Remember how I stood before you to speak, to speak good on their behalf, so as to turn away your wrath from them. Therefore, give their children over to famine and deliver them up to the power of the sword and let their wives become childless and widowed. Let their men also be smitten to death, their young men struck down by the sword in battle. May an outcry be heard from their houses when you suddenly bring raiders upon them, for they have dug a pit to capture me and hidden snares for my feet. Yet you, O Lord, know all their deadly designs against me. Do not forgive their iniquity or blot out their sin from your sight, but may they be overthrown before you. Deal with them in the time of your anger. How would you feel if someone stood up in our congregation on Sunday and prayed that prayer? Whew. God, take their children away. You know, let their young men die in battle, be slain with the sword. Make sure their women end up widows and their children end up orphans. Whoa. Do you struggle with this a little bit? Let's kick that around some. Do you struggle with a prayer like this? You feel like Jeremiah is right to pray this? Is, is he wrong to pray this? I mean, this is, this is pretty tough. Pretty tough language. What do you think? I think he was human. You think he was human? And he's simply revealing the expressions of his heart, the feelings that he's enduring because of all this bad stuff that, that he's dealing with. I think, that, I think that's part of it. Kyle, what do you think? I agree with that. I think the part that really struck me about this is that um, at the beginning, in verse 19, he says, listen to what my opponents are saying. Um, for they, and then, for they have dug a pit for me, remember how I stood before thee to speak good on their behalf. And then at the end, he says again um, that they dug a pit to capture me and hidden snare for my feet. And so he's like, I've been doing this. This is what their response has been, so go ahead. Which... I do struggle with that a little bit, but I understand because I'm doing it. Okay. But it's, it's about, he's kind of reacting to what they're doing to him, which is, a, which is an interesting thought that struck me there about him, given the rest of the way he's... Yeah. Okay. All right. So here, here's something that I think is important that uh, would be good for us to think about. There's nothing in this prayer about personal vengeance. Did you notice that? Jeremiah is not saying, I'm going to go get my shotgun and go mow these people down. I'm going to go get my sword and kill these folks. That's not what he says. He calls upon God to bring about a judgment upon the people. This is not about a personal vendetta. For years... Now, at this point, Jeremiah has been saying to the nation, judgment is coming, judgment is coming, repent or else. This is what God is going to do if you don't turn from your wicked ways. And now the people have turned against Jeremiah. They're threatening his life. And it seems to me that what Jeremiah is saying in this prayer is, God, would you just go ahead and do what you've been saying you're going to do? <laughs> You've been threatening judgment for years. Let's go ahead and, and make it happen. Okay? He calls upon God to do this judging. It's not something that, um, that, that he personally is going to do. Back in chapters 14 and 15, Jeremiah was pleading with God not to bring judgment yet. Right. He, he was pleading with God. And we looked at some of those verses and that was in chapter 14. You may remember God said, Jeremiah, don't pray for this people. It, it's too far gone. We're past the point of turning. Don't even pray for them. They're not going to hear you. So God had had refused Jeremiah's intercession for the people. And I think Jeremiah is just saying, look, I, I've been saying for a long time that your judgment is coming and 
man, it sure would be great if you'd just go ahead and bring it. Because he is human. Because he is dealing with personal attacks. And when that is happening to you directly and personally, of course you want God to act, right? Go ahead. Bring on what you've said you're going to bring. Christine? So I'm going to relate this in a kind of far-fetched, not far-fetched way, but your dad, when he says an amazing prayer, often will say, Lord, come. come yeah. Quickly. Yes. We need this. You know, and so ultimately, you know, I hear those words and I think, ah, but we have so much life to live. No. <laughs> what is our ultimate goal? What are we striving for? Amen. Each and every day? Yeah, that's good. And, you know, sometimes it is hard to hear that, to understand that, Lord, come quickly. Come take us to where our home is. Yeah. And it's just hard to, it's hard to swallow sometimes, but it's, it is so true. Yeah, th so that, true. that's a great, great comment. All right, anything else? I know we read this language and we think, whoo, man, that's pretty, right? The Psalms are filled with this. There, there's a category of Psalms called imprecatory Psalms. Um, and and that, that's what all of them are. It, it's Psalms where it's like, you know, Lord, make sure a millstone falls on their head, you know, and you're like, whoa, man. <laughs> but again, it's important to remember, it's not personal vengeance. It's not, I'm going to go be a renegade and, and you know, uh, fulfill this myself. I'm calling upon God to do what he's already promised he's going to do. He's going to judge the wicked. Just make it happen sooner rather than later. All right. So let's go to chapter 19 now. Let's continue with this idea of the, the pottery and the clay and, and what, um, what, what God is doing. Chapter 19 and verse 1 Thus says the Lord, go and buy a potter's earthenware jar, presumably from the same potter from chapter 18, right? I mean, that would make sense. Where else would he go? Go buy a potter's earthenware jar and take some of the elders of the people and some of the senior priests. All right, notice his audience in verse 1. He's to take some of the elders and the senior priests, some of the older supposed to be wiser men of the nation, all right? So he's got this jar, and he's got this audience. Then, verse 2, go out to the valley of Ben-Hinnom, which is by the entrance of the potsherd gate, and proclaim there the words that I tell you. Now, in the following verses, Jeremiah is uh, speaking for the Lord, and he's going to talk about the... Uh, the idolatry of the people and what they've been doing all these years, okay? So then in verse 9, or excuse me, in verse 10, God says to Jeremiah, you are to break the jar in the sight of the men who accompany you. So take that jar and, and I guess just throw it on the ground and, and shatter it into pieces. This is an object visible lesson that Jeremiah is presenting. Say to them, after you break this jar, verse 11, just so will I break this people and this city, even as one breaks a potter's vessel, which cannot again be repaired. It doesn't take a whole lot to break a clay pot. They're durable. They're strong, yes. You know, they're dishwasher safe, right? That's what my uncle's products all say. Microwave and dishwasher safe. But you know what they can't do? They can't sustain somebody taking it and throwing it on the ground. They're going to shatter. And God says, just as easily as it was for Jeremiah to shatter that jar, I can shatter Judah when it comes time to do that. So... This is how, verse 12, I will treat this place and its inhabitants. Just like that jar that Jeremiah threw down and broke and it can't be repaired easily. That's what I'm going to do. You remember from chapter 13, the waistband that we talked about the other day. All right, Jeremiah is using some object to live out this illustration before the eyes of the people. The potter's house that we just talked about in chapter 18 was another symbolic action that utilized some kind of object that God would say, okay, you see that? That's like what I'm going to do over here. It's just this illustration. 
So he announces God's intentions of judgment, and he's going to break the jar in front of the people. Remember, what was the feature of the clay in chapter 18 that I wanted you to remember? It's soft, it's malleable, pliable, right. You could shape it, you can mold it. What about this vessel in chapter 19? It's hardened. It's already been through the kiln. It's been through the fire. There's no reshaping at this point. It's cooked. And when Jeremiah throws it down, it breaks. And I think there is a, a great contrast that, that we should see here and that the people of Judah should have seen back then. God can reshape and He can mold when it's in that condition. But when it's hardened, there's no shaping that can be done. And isn't that true of the hearts of people? And that's why Jeremiah is continually talking about the stubbornness of the nation, the hardness of heart. They refuse to repent. They turn their backs on Him. And he uses all of those expressions to say, you're a hardened kiln-dried pot. I can't do anything with you. The only thing left for a kiln-dried pot is, is, is two, there's, there's two options of what can be done with a kiln-dried pot. One, it can be used for its intended purpose. Or two, it's going to break. It, it, it's going to be dropped or thrown down and it's at risk of breaking. I know that's not the, in, you don't make a pot to, to turn and break it, but there's no other alternatives for what can be done. You can't reshape it into something else. You either use it for its intended purpose or it stands chance of breaking. So which one do you want? And this illustration of what God is going to do is speaking about the hearts of the nation, the hearts of the people that are hardened and stubborn and refusing to do what God wants them to do. Okay, you follow that? You see these illustrations? Okay. Now here in 19, as God has spoken about this judgment that's going to come, I want to look at some of the things that he says. And this is, again, looking to the future. This is a warning. But the very things that God says are going to happen in these verses are the things that the book of Lamentations confirms did indeed happen. All right, so look at verse 7. I will make void the council of Judah and Jerusalem in this place, and I will cause them to fall by the sword before their enemies and by the hand of those who seek their life. People will die by the sword. That certainly happened when the Babylonian armies invaded. I will give over their carcasses as food for the birds of the sky and the beasts of the earth. That's really kind of unpleasant to think about, but the Babylonians are going to kill so many people it will be a mass slaughter. There's just going to be bodies scattered all over the land. And the vultures are going to feast. Verse 8. I will make this city a desolation and an object of hissing. Everyone who passes by it will be astonished and hiss because of all its disasters. Verse 9 is perhaps the most troubling of all uh, to me. I will make them eat the flesh of their sons and the flesh of their daughters, and they will eat one another's flesh in the siege and in the distress with which their enemies and those who seek their life will distress them. When a nation sets up a siege against an enemy city, what, what do they do to the food supply? Cut it it's cut off. If you're inside the walls of the city, all you have to eat is whatever stores you have inside the walls. But when those run out and people get hungry, what happens? <laughs> people, you start eating the pets, right? <laughs> you know, you eat the dogs and the cats and you eat the horses and the camels. You eat the animals first, but when those run out, what do you do? And this is what people resorted to. They resorted to cannibalism. And Lamentations talks about that. Jeremiah says, I, I watched people eating their own children because they were so hungry. Now, you know, did mothers and fathers like go and kill their children and then eat them? Man, I sure would hope not. But in a siege kind of a situation, who are going to be the first ones to die? The weak ones, which would usually be the children or the sick ones, right? And so, you know, here's a, a family who's just lost a child to starvation. 
uh, or to disease that came on because of starvation, right? They were malnourished, which left them vulnerable. And this child dies and the parents, hey, what, what are we going to do? We're, we're trying to survive, right? Okay, I wish y'all could see everybody's faces right now. Because <laughs> everybody's like, you know, you're, you're making these just horrible grimaces. And that's the point, right? See, here's the thing. When Jeremiah said this in Jeremiah 19, it hasn't happened yet. He's talking about this is what will happen if you don't change. And when he preaches that, he's hoping to get a reaction like Jody's. He's hoping that people will say, oh, you know, God forbid, we don't want it to come to this. Maybe we should wake up and change. But alas, they're not going to do that. So when we come to Lamentations, you're, you're going to see in very explicit terms some really upsetting stuff. Um, and that's not what God wanted. But based upon the people's reactions... And based upon the way that they lived, it seems that that's what they wanted. Jody. So for me, I think that they have no hope in heaven, so they would go ahead and eat their their two children. So for me, because I have hope for heaven, I'd rather starve to death than eat my child. Yeah, right. Let's do whatever we got to do to stay alive. Yeah, yeah right. Yeah, uh, okay, so, so there's an outlook uh, difference uh, that you're my saying. Dad, my dad used to threaten to skin me alive. <laughs> <laughs> not, not so he could eat you, though, but just, just because you, whatever you did to deserve it, I'm sure it was justified. <laughs> All right. Well, listen, that, that's all I've got. I know we're a little bit early still, but... Um, but yes, please do. Uh, this is kind of a, a sidebar, but um, I'm going to be I'm working on a, on, a, on a talk for the Lord's Supper for next month, and I was looking at Jeremiah 18. This, this whole concept of using things that people, everyday things that people can relate to in order to overlay it with a spiritual message is, 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 is shown throughout the Bible here. That's what the parables are really about, um, you know, the leaven and fishers of men and all that kind of thing. And uh, I think there's value in that for us today, for us to get so uh, focused on just what it is that we're doing. If we just stop and think about whatever it is that we're doing on a secular level at the time, get our minds trained to think, what kind of spiritual application can I make to whatever it is I happen to be doing? Mm-hmm. And when you do that, it gets your thinking more in a spiritual track all the time so that you're not so distracted with mowing the lawn or doing the laundry or whatever. There's, there, there, there is value and there's benefit into thinking about whatever it is I'm doing and trying to, trying to think of a spiritual application of that. And that's kind of what's happening here in Jeremiah with, with the pot and the potter and all that. Yeah, yeah. The, the prophets are, are often giving these object lessons, you know, where they can look at things and use that as illustrations. Uh, and it's good for us to do that in our teaching, especially with younger people. And, you know, in, in kids' classes, Bible classes, we, teachers do that all the time because kids can see those objects and, and, and make that parallel. But it's good for us to do as, as adults as well. It reminds me of the first lesson I saw you preach when I had COVID when I was in Pennsylvania on a watch party. Oh, yeah. Was that the Candyland lesson? Candyland. Everybody remember that one? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I, I still have people talk about that, you know. I can't play Candyland in the same way anymore. All right. Thanks, everybody.